Good evening. I'm calling the order to order the meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, March 3rd, 2022. I am Bill Hainer, the chair. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. When I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. In the affirmative. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Rampey. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Dr. Holman. Sorry, yes. Dr. McNeil. Yes. Mr. Spiegel. Yes. Mr. Mason. Yes. Ms. Elmer. Yes. Is Ms. Ferranti the AEA representative here? Yes. Yes, I am. Hi. Thank you. Uh, student representative, Ms. Carmody. Yes. And is uh, Ms. Shalaru here yet? Not quite. Okay. Tonight's meeting of the Alex, uh School Committee is being conducted remotely, consistent with the act signed into law on June 16th, 2021, that extends certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency. The act includes an extension until April 1st, 2022, of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020, executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The governor's audit, which is referenced with agenda materials on the town's website, this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before I begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom and is being recorded and is also simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others, and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record for the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening to listening who do not provide comment, and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. At this time, uh, I will uh, invite public, um, excuse me, public, uh, start the public hearing on the budget and invite any members of the uh, committee to offer any comment. Is there any member of the committee that would like to comment on the budget at this time? Is there anyone from the administration that wishes to make a comment on the budget? Is there anyone else on the, in the public in our group here that wishes to make a comment? Seeing no one at this time, I will end the uh, public hearing on the budget. Bill, Bill, yes, you have to invite the members of the public to. Uh, okay. Come in. Is there? Uh, thank you, Paul. Ra and there... Everybody, raise your hand. No restrictions uh, okay. in terms of who can speak. So, Miss Diggins, you're going to have to be aware of anyone that wishes to speak uh, on the budget. Okay. So, I'm let looking. Me know. Now. I'm I'm checking the attendees now. Okay. I do not see any hands raised right now. Mr. Cardin, you just joined us. Do you have any comments at this time on the budget? Uh, no, thank you. Okay. Hearing, hearing and seeing no one wishing to make a comment on the budget, I will uh, end the public hearing on the budget. At this time, I will uh, ask Dr. Holman. She has an announcement to share with us. Thank you, Mr. Hayner. I am going to um, quickly turn this over to a guest that we have on the call. Ms. Kathy Hassey is the scholarship chair for the Massachusetts School Nursing Organization. And she has some very exciting news to share with the community and the committee tonight. Kathy, it's all yours. 
Thank you, Dr. Holman. Yes, my name is Kathy Hassey. I'm actually director of the Northeastern University School Health Academy, but also on the MSNO board. And I am the chair of scholarships and awards. And I am so excited. We had a lot of submissions this year. And um, your school nurse in high school, um, Sarah Lee, actually has been named the Massachusetts School Nurse Organization School Nurse of the Year for the school year 2021-2022. And I was so excited, I have to say, reading the submissions, I had to recuse myself as Doreen had to recuse herself um, because I've had Sarah um, as a student in her graduate program. Um, but the submission from Dr. Homan and from um, Doreen just was, was absolutely excellent. And Dr. Homan talked about how Sarah organized countless vaccination clinics in collaboration with the town, developed systems for tracking and tracing COVID-19, and was the driving force behind Arlington being the number one town in the state for pediatric COVID vaccinations in November and December of 2021. And she's overseen pool testing. She's done just an amazing job. And she said, our students are healthier and safer and happier, thanks to her incredible work. And from her nurse leader, um, Sarah serves as a role model training new nurses, precept student nurses, and serves as the advisor to the Future Nurses Club which we need a lot of those, Sarah, so keep going. Um, she also serves as an advisor to the Arlington Youth Health and Safety Coalition and created the School Emergency Response Team Protocol and updates it annually. She's also a CPR instructor. instructor. She is a nationally certified school nurse and the nominee's an outstanding school nurse that exemplifies leadership and is well known to the community. And I will say, she's a great graduate student as well. <laughs> if I can say that. Um, I also would like to say, since I have the school committee here, you have one of the best uh, nurse leaders in the state uh, in Arlington. Um, very proud to call her uh, a friend and a colleague. And I didn't know, Doreen, did you um, want to add anything to that? Yeah, I do. Thank you, Kathy. I really appreciate that. And we're very proud of Sarah. And I am wearing two hats tonight because um, as the director of nursing for Arlington, um, you know, I want to congratulate Sarah. She does outstanding work. Uh, I've never met anybody like her. Um, you know, in addition to her, her regular full-time job, she's the COVID lead for the district and she's done an amazing job. And then on behalf of MSNO, I am the president of MSNO. Um, we are extremely pleased that Sarah was selected this year. As she mentioned, the, you know, the nominations were very competitive. Um, and according to the nomination committee, Sarah's uh, nominations stood out above and beyond the rest of them. Um, so congratulations, Sarah. We're very proud of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am, um, I, it's hard to not get emotional, so I won't, but I, I will say this, that I am a very proud um, school nurse. And I think that Arlington has shown our commitment to the health and safety of our students every day. And um, I'm honored to accept this, not for myself so much, but for our entire district and our Arlington school nurse team. Like I'm only one person and this team is amazing. And I'm, I'm very proud. Thank you very, very much. Dr. Do you... I wanted to ask if Dr. Danger had anything to add and then I'll close it out. Well, I mean, I just want to say I've been, I've worked with Sarah now for nine years. Uh, she is an important part of the Arlington High School family. Um, this last year and a half, we've shared her with the rest of the district as the COVID lead. And um, she's really taken off. Everyone else has seen in her what we've seen in her for a long time. Even before COVID came along, she was a leader in vaccination in the high school. She, on her own, would set up a vaccination clinics extra above the Board of Health for staff, above the Board of Health for students when necessary. Um, she has made our clinic be an inclusive and really welcoming environment. She partnered with Ponder with Arlington Eats to make sure we have food resources. She's set up what we call Ponder Threads, which is a whole sort of clothing closet for students to really have it be a full service program. I could go on and on. Um, she's really a, an amazing member of the team 
And uh, she's, as the senior nurse, really mentored in a new group. And we have a wonderful clinic with really amazing professionals. And so I, I couldn't be happier. I, no one deserves it more. And um, she really reflects the best of what we are. So thank you, Sarah. Um, I've only been here for about eight months now. I've lost count, but um, I can't I can't possibly count the number of times Sarah and I have landed on the phone with one another, talking through a scenario or talking through a new protocol or trying to figure things out along with Doreen. And it has made the transition into a new role. And I'm sure Doreen feels the same way as she's new to Arlington this year too. Uh, much easier to know what an incredibly competent and capable and exceptional and just wonderful Gener generally person um, I have leading the COVID work in the district. And it, it, she's always been somebody to rely on. She's always offered sound advice. And um, I'm so thrilled that she's being honored with this. We're very lucky to have you, Sarah. Arlington is very lucky to have you. And this is very well deserved. I just want to make one quick comment that every time I've seen Sarah, as hardworking as she is, she always has a smile. She always has something positive to say. Uh, how you doing? Great. How's it going? Fantastic. She has been, we are truly, truly lucky to have you and honored. Does anyone else wish to say anything before I move on? Ms. Morgan. And I think just to add to what Mr. Hainer said, it's one thing to be like that with adults all the time, but she's also like that with all of our students. And she's taken what can be a stressful situation, being pulled out of class to be in a disaggregated pool, and you're sitting there like, do I have COVID? What happened? Um, and, and she's just done so with our students with so much grace and empathy. And, um, you know, she treats them with such respect. Um, and uh, it's just, it's, it's so wonderful to see. So thank you, Sarah. So excited for you. This is wonderful. Thank you all. Thank you, Sarah, very much. Thank you. Uh, everyone. Thank you. One more round of applause, everyone. Thank you again. Uh, moving on to Arlington High School student representatives. Uh, Ms. Carmody, uh, Amy, uh, Megan, do you have something to share with us tonight? Uh, yes. So, although it um, it was announced earlier in earlier meetings, it was did have to be canceled. But we are very excited that again we are going to be hosting Battle of the Bands, and it will be on March 18th at 7 p.m. at the Regent Theater. Um, all are welcome, and tickets will be going on sale soon. So look out for that. Great. Anything, how Amy? The, oh. How did the opening of the new school go? It was great. We talked to students and all of them loved the school. Everyone was saying how it just didn't feel like Arlington was so fancy, but everyone loves it. Great. We all set? Thank you. Uh, at this time, uh, I'm going to, for public comment, members of the public who wish to address the committee, there will be a 30 minute minutes of public comment, depending on the number of people sign up. Time allotments may be reduced, but will not exceed three minutes each. If the number of people who sign up exceeds that can be done in 30 minutes, the number of speakers will be capped and will be invited to speak based on the timestamp of their email to Ms. Diggins. The school committee respectfully requests participants of the public to utilize their camera, if possible, before speaking and to adhere to the public comment policy, BEDH, that requires participants to give us their name and address. Speakers may offer such objective criticisms of the school operations and programs and cons that concern them. But in public session, the committee will not hear personal complaints about school personnel nor against any member of the school community, except for the school committee or the superintendent in their capacity as operational leader of the Arlington Public Schools. Nor will the committee hear anything that might identify or infringe upon the student's privacy by name. If you'd like to sign up to speak, please email ediggins at arlington.k12.ma.us by 12 noon of the date of the meeting. We have three people that have signed up. Uh, uh, Gina Kame, I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Gina? Good 
Ms. Diggins, if she's not here, just let me know. I did see her name pop up. Uh, okay. Let me just double check. I did see Gina's name. I don't know if she's calling in from a telephone. Um, hey, I, you got it. She's on. Gina, can you hear us? Your microphone is off, Gina. Um, hi, sorry, I needed to be let in. Sorry. Okay, there you go. You're on. So, okay, great. Thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I won't take a lot of time because I want to give my time um, to other participants who wish to speak. Um, my only comments, I did write in a written comment. Um, my comment for this evening would be, please lift the mask mandate for all of the children in Arlington public school system, including the preschoolers. Let them and their families decide if they would if they want to wear a mask, and um, that would be my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. Can we get name and address of the previous speaker? Sure. My name is Gina Carmi, and I live at Fifty Five Claremont Ave in Arlington. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, uh, Michelle Afan Afanos would be the next speaker. Michelle, when you come on, would you please give us your full name and uh, your address? Sure, my name is Michelle Afanos, 19 uh, Moccasin Path, Arlington. Um, before my time spot starts, I just wanted to ask, so only three people allowed to, to speak, because I know there's a lot of people that are attending this um, meeting that wanted to have an opportunity to speak and they may not have been able to email in a timely okay. fashion. In order to get our program together, we needed people to announce that they're going to be on prior to 12 noon of the day of the meeting. That's part of our school committee policy. They're welcome to speak at the next meeting if they didn't get it in this tonight. Will it be the same thing you have to email prior to? Prior to noon on the day of the school committee meeting, yes. Hmm. They could do it tomorrow morning and, and be listed uh, for, for the, the next, next meeting. meeting. Yes. Yeah. All right. I, I think that's unfortunate. I think that there's a missed opportunity to hear from people um, that are on this meeting and there's only three because I, I think that's a missed opportunity. Perhaps that should be thought through a little bit more for the next time. So um, thank you for your time and attention. The email that I sent to the superintendent and the school committee included the very wise saying that if we do not learn from our mistakes, we are doomed to repeat them. Indeed, I feel that mistakes were made and harm has been done. Um, this need not happen again. This is an op uh, an education, an educational opportunity. I have worked in healthcare for a very long time. I understand and agree with the overall concept of the precautionary principle. It was a novel coronavirus. It was a new pandemic. Measures were put in place to protect the public, but once these measures have been deemed ineffective and indeed harmful, they should be immediately repealed and replaced. And I understand the uncertainty and confusion we've all pay, have faced in the last two years. I too held the CDC, the NIH, and all these three letter agencies in very high esteem, no longer. For all the science is not a slogan to me. As a nurse, I demonstrate and advocate for the use of evidence-based practice. And I can tell you with all certainty that there has been an abject failure of public health and these leading institutions to be honest and transparent. I will not bore you with my personal journey of discovery, but I will say it started with curiosity. Sadly, some of the sadder victims of this pandemic have been critical thinking skills, common sense, and courage. I ask you to look at those three things going forward. The ability to look at any given situation and determine that it doesn't make sense. Have the curiosity to think of the other side. Have the courage to speak out when you know it doesn't make sense and it's wrong. There's a great book uh, by Stephen Coveney, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. The key principle is first seek to understand, then seek to be understood. Why are all these parents so upset with the school committee, the, the teachers unions and the school boards about masking? Why are they so upset about the children not being in school? Have the curiosity to look into these. Why are they looking into going into surety bonds, personal liability insurance? These parents have been pushed to their limits. And then when I read the uh, exemption form for two to five year olds, it's no longer anecdotal. The evidence is that masking is very harmful to children. 
we, we have been hit with a tsunami of anxiety, fear, and depression on these children from the masking. It needs to end. There should not be an exemption form for parents that have been pushed to the limit and feel exceedingly disregarded as it is. Speak to the parents of, of children with special needs and, and listen to the heartbreaking stories of what these masks have caused these children. I don't understand why we're continuing these metrics that don't make sense. Children are at not, not at risk for COVID. We know that, but we do know that, that masks are harming the children. When as a society have we ever risked the health and well-being of the children to protect the adults? This is wrong. This should not happen. It shouldn't happen again. I implore you to be curious and please seek what's in the best interest of the children. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is Dolores McGee here? The key. Yes, Dolores is here. Would, Dolores, oh. would you please give us your name and your address? Hello. Yeah, hello. We can oh, hear hi you. There. Sorry, I I wasn't sure if I was um, unmuted yet. Hi there. Um, I'm uncomfortable giving my address, and I'm wondering if I can still participate in the meeting. You may go ahead. Thank you. So. Um, I would like to just use my time to also request that the mask mandates for Arlington school children be dropped immediately and that measures are put in place to ensure that such mandates are never again considered in the future. Um, research is coming out that um, is it making it clear that a lot of these COVID protocols were um, largely not only ineffective, but they also came with a host of other negative consequences. Um, obviously mask wearing in order for it to be effective has to be done very, very particularly, which in small children in particular, it's, it's not, um, you know, a doctor will tell you that those surgical masks are used to prevent droplets from coming out of their mouths, not to prevent things from coming in. Um, and that the only really effective masks are the N95s and the doctors are, uh, they have to take courses on how to put them on properly. So we know that they're not really doing anything for the children except for creating a lot of social anxiety, depression. Um, there's a lot of divisiveness, bullying, mask shaming, et cetera. And all of this is contributing to little by little um, a diminished human experience. And you, you cannot put a price on that. that. These children will not get this time back in their lives. Being behind masks, at these developmentally critical times in their lives when they're learning all sorts of things academically, socially, emotionally, has been extremely detrimental to their health and to their experience as humans. Um, and just to their overall sense of community. Um, so uh, I, I would just like to request that the mask mandate be dropped immediately and that we never consider this again. Um, we have to learn from our mistakes. Um, and my understanding also is that it's actually not even legal because it's masks are a medical device and you can't mandate that. Um, so I just, I'd, I'd like to have that on the record. Um, and I would also like to bring up a point about the Arlington Community Ed being um, requiring a vaccine verification to participate in any of the classes. Um, my understanding is that that um, is that they have to follow the guidelines by the school committee and the superintendent. And um, it just seems very, very um, contradictory to me that something with the word community in its name is discriminating against people who either are not vaccinated or just choose not to participate in a world that mandates a vaccine. So um, I would just like to have the record show that um, I'm requesting that that be reconsidered and dropped um, as well. So thank you very much. And I, I would also, I guess, if I have just a few seconds left, like to say, I'd really like to see us getting together in person. This seems very informal, if you see, uh, I'm sorry, very too formal, very um, restrictive. And again, it does not feel like a community. Uh, you know, we're, people cannot respond organically. There's all these rules around how, how we have to participate. Um, I know that everybody on this call has been to Costco, has been to the gym, has been to dinners out. I see no reason why we can't sit as a community together and have conversations about what's happening in this community. 
because it's changing very, very fast with these measures that are not dropping away. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is um, update on COVID-19 mass recommendations, Dr. Holman. Thank you. Give me a moment to share my screen. We should be seeing a slide that says masking recommendation background. Yes. Fantastic. All right, so I want to get started with uh, my recommendation to the school committee tonight around how to move forward with our masking um, protocols at, uh, in Arlington Public Schools with a little bit of background to get us going. So beginning on Wednesday, February 16th, 2022 of this year, the Arlington Board of Health has lifted the town of Arlington mask requirement for public spaces. So that happened just before our February break. Um, effective Monday, February 28th, the statewide requirement that this was a date that had actually been set by the commissioner earlier in the year um, when the January 15th date passed when we were right in the middle of the Omicron surge. And so at that time, the commissioner set Monday, February 28th is the date at which he would consider whether or not to extend the mask mandate by the state. And so that date came up on February 28th and the commissioner decided not to extend the mask mandate, which made masking requirements in schools a local decision. On Friday, February 25th, uh, over the course of our uh, winter break, the CDC no longer recommended universal masking in schools or on school transportation, but still required universal masking on public transportation. And that was in response to adjustments to their school-based recommendations that they decided to also lift it on school transportation. And then on Friday, February 25th, CDC also issued some new community level tools to help guide decision making about necessity of restrictions based on some new metrics, um, not just cases, cases are part of the equation that they're using to determine a community's level of risk, but also on hospital um, beds that are being used, hospital admissions, and the total number of new cases in an area. Again, still part of the calculation, but with a heavier emphasis on the state of hospitals in a particular area. And the CDC recommended that case rates um, are no longer as heavily weighted in that formula. So per that new risk calculation tool, Middlesex County is considered to have low levels of COVID-19 and is therefore in the green, um, at which point the CDC says that maintaining some of these restrictions um, is no longer necessary. So I wanna give a little bit of data that is backing up the recommendation that I have for the committee to consider tonight. APS vaccination rates for our eligible students um, range from 85% at some schools all the way up into the mid 90% at other schools. The APS staff vaccination rate is 97.9%, very high thanks to the requirements that we have had for staff to either get vaccinated, fully vaccinated, or uh, give us um, a religious or medical exemption request. Approximately 70% of all APS students and staff are participating in our weekly PCR pool testing. That happens once a week. We typically try to get that in in the first couple of days of the week uh, so that we don't have students who might be carrying the virus present in our schools and we can isolate quickly. The number of positive pools and cases in the schools, in our town, in the county, and in the state have dramatically decreased after the Omicron surge, which has been just um, wonderful to watch. Those cases cruise down, and you can see the case rates uh, on, at the table on the right. We haven't seen, and this is significant because after every um, break period that we have had, Throughout the entire pandemic, we have seen a significant spike in cases following the break. We do have an increase in cases this week, but it's not a spike in the same way that we've seen increases in cases after previous break periods. 80% um, of students and staff are participating in our at-home testing program. They take a test home every week. We ask them to screen on Thursdays or to use those tests for symptomatic testing or to use those tests to test to return in the event that they actually have a COVID-19 uh, infection. And COVID-19 levels in our area have reached their lowest levels since July of 2021, and that's according to the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority, who's been tracking COVID levels in wastewater. So as a result of all of that information and some of the shifting landscape of recommendations, both from the CDC and from our state entities, my recommendation for the school committee to consider and discuss this evening and choose to support if they wish is that effective March 7th, that's next Monday of 2022, we would make masks optional for all students and staff in the Arlington Public Schools, except in a few unique situations where masks would continue to be required um, unless an exemption was offered. So 
All staff at Menominee Preschool and in our APS daycares, except when instructionally appropriate and beneficial for staff to remove masks based on their professional judgment, would still be asked to wear a mask in school. Students at Menotomy Preschool and in APS daycare serve between the ages of two and five and are able to wear masks are also asked to continue wearing masks for now. Families will are, are um, invited to apply and qualify for a special mask exemption for their student at Menotomy Preschool and APS daycares. The masking requirements at Menotomy Preschool and in our daycares would be revisited at least monthly. And I want to say a few words about this particular requirement before I move on to the other requirements or exemptions to this particular adjustment to our protocols. The goal of this requirement in our Menotomy Preschool and APS daycares is not to maintain mandatory masking in perpetuity or even necessarily for the rest of this school year. It's to move slowly into the next phase with the ability to be flexible and assess success as we go in those environments where parents have a choice about vaccinating their students. These exemptions have been discussed at the department by the with the Department of Health, with staff, and with families at Menonomy Preschool, and a range of opinions exists on these topics. I've spent significant time over the last several weeks meeting with in person and speaking on the phone with families who are impacted by this change. Um, at Menonomy Preschool, we have two really significant factors that influence this decision. One is that a large proportion of students at Menonomy Preschool have medical conditions that could compromise them uh, or make them more likely to contract a very serious case of COVID-19. Some of those students are not able to make the choice to mask. And so it is um, incumbent upon us, we believe, and the Department of Health believes, and the staff at Monotomy believe, to make sure that we are doing what we can to protect them while we learn more about what this particular change in protocol is going to mean for our schools. The other thing that's unique about Monotomy is that parents do not have the choice about vaccinating their students because we do not have a vaccine for ages three to five. Certainly some of our students at Monotomy are able to be vaccinated and have been, and we may expect to see some exemption requests from them. We may even see exemption requests from families of students who have IEPs and have medical conditions that may make them more vulnerable to um, COVID-19 whose parents still want them to be able to get their speech language um, lessons without a mask on or uh, have some of their lessons without a mask on because it's instructionally beneficial. We're all weighing risks. And so we invite any families who think their student would benefit from a mask exemption to please apply for one. And it is our intention to make sure that those are granted when it's going to be really beneficial to those students. And that if there are families whose students can wear a mask to school, they continue to send their child with a mask for now. And we will reevaluate this at the beginning of April. Other places where this exception exists is on all school buses and transportation vans through at least the month of March. Again, this is an opportunity for us to assess how things go. And if we are in a position where things are going well, then at the beginning of April, I would look to the guidelines that would allow us to uh, remove masks on school buses and transportation vans. Uh, again, we have a lot of students who might be more vulnerable to COVID-19 who ride our transportation vans in particular. And so while I recognize that the CDC has lifted this particular requirement, they are still requiring masks on public transportation. And we would like the latitude to keep masks on on our transportation for now while we make masks optional in all of our schools K-12. They would also be required masks in all school health offices and medical waiting rooms and for COVID-19 positive individuals who return to school as part of our test to return program during days six through 10, except when they are eating, drinking, or are outdoors. So in addition to this recommendation, which you all will have a chance to discuss in a moment, we are going to continue many of our mitigation measures, which have been working very well for us. So this is one mitigation measure that will become optional, but we have a number of them that we will continue. Those include weekly pool testing, our at-home symptomatic testing, and in-school symptomatic testing, our test to return program that has been very successful and now submitted for academic journals to consider publishing on, which we're very proud of, our APS at-home testing program. We are continuing to replace our 13 air filters on all our filtration systems in our schools. They were last replaced in January of 2022, and they'll be replaced again in April of 22, according to our um, three times a year protocol for making sure that those filters get replaced on our handling units and the use of our standalone HEPA air filters in all instructional spaces, which we will ask staff to make sure are turned on. All students and staff should continue to report positive results on our reporting form, and we will continue to keep track of those and report them out on our COVID dashboard. And the last bit that I would like to speak to is um, 
what our continued mitigation strategies will be with respect to maintaining some ability to keep masking in our toolbox for COVID-19. And then I'll also talk about how we're going to support students and staff from this. So um, APS has used a lot of strategies when outbreaks have occurred in our schools. Every time we have a situation where we have multiple cases in a single classroom or school, or we have some level of evidence that there may be person to person transmission, we take tools out of our toolbox and we respond to each situation because it's a unique situation, potentially in a different way. We always collaborate with the Department of Health and Human Services, and on occasion we collaborate with state with the DESI to determine what our next steps should be. It's our intention always to avoid opposing, imposing any additional restrictions and to avoid any actions that result in loss of time in school. However, when it is necessary, we need to keep tools in our COVID-19 outbreak response toolbox because it allows for students to stay in school and masking could be one of those tools. So we would like the ability to flexibly reimpose a masking restriction when the alternative may be a missed, missed days of school for students in a classroom or school where an outbreak occurs. We've had three instances this year where we have had to close a classroom. Uh, for a couple of days we've had to send students home because we have an outbreak in that space because we have a concern about ventilation and in those instances it would be more um, desirable for us to be able to say everyone in this class is going to wear their masks for the rest of this week and we're going to keep an eye on things we also reimpose um, here and there we've had to do this this year physical distancing and cohorting restrictions in individual classrooms we had actually relaxed a lot of those restrictions uh, right as we reached december and then with the omicron surge we've re-implemented re a lot of them um, we would like the ability to repeat test consented students in classrooms where outbreaks occur. We do this now. If we have a situation where we have multiple cases in a classroom, sometimes we'll repool that class um, and we will continue to do that. And then as a last resort, we would like to retain the right to um, close a classroom or school when ventilation is compromised or when outbreaks occur, as we have been doing. What the masking protocol allows for is for us to avoid any situations where students might be missing school, which we believe is more detrimental than being asked to wear a mask for a few days while we allow an outbreak to fizzle out. And finally, I'd like to speak to what we're going to do to make sure that we're supporting students and staff as we make this important transition into the next phase of the virus. Uh, we would like, we have shared talking points and suggestions with um, administrators. We shared those on Tuesday. Administrators have begun sharing those out with their staff. They have created new resources from those, including slide decks that, that teachers can use with staff, um, that staff can use with students. We have had building and department administrators working with our social work guidance and nursing teams at their schools to adapt and provide resources to teachers and answer any questions that teachers have at staff meetings this week. And we've shared several topic, talking points with teachers. They are listed there, uh, but primarily they, re they revolve around making sure that students understand particularly, um, well, really all of our students, that people may choose to wear their masks sometimes, remove them at other times. There could be lots of different reasons why somebody chooses to wear a mask or not. Um, some people are comfortable with this option, others are not, and that we really need to make sure we're not judging an individual's choice or pressuring someone to choose in a certain way. We're also working to make sure we emphasize that the science and several professional organizations have told us that it's safe for those who choose to remove their masks and that if you're ever unsure about anything, you are more than welcome to meet with our teachers, nurses, social workers who will talk with our students if they have any questions about this. So that concludes my presentation on this renewed recommendation and I've brought I appreciate the school committee giving me the authority to make a decision around this, um, given the public discourse on this particular topic and the fact that I think it's important that we are one voice in moving forward on this next phase of our, of our work mitigating COVID-19. I wanted to bring the recommendation to the school committee for conversation um, and your supportive vote uh, if you so choose this evening. So with that, I will conclude, answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Holman. Uh, I, I wanna begin this by saying you have my full support and what you have done, uh, I think you've done, a, you and your staff have done a phenomenal job to the state, and I would like to continue you having my support going forward. I will now entertain any other comments from committee members. Uh, Dr. Rampey. Thank you. Um, Dr. Homan, thank you very much for your detailed and clear policy and the rationale behind it. Um, I also, and um, in support of it, I think one thing that hasn't been 
voice specifically is that all of this stuff is a risk benefit ratio. And what we're feeling at this point is that the risk for the elementary school students who have been vaccinated is less than the benefits that are derived if they choose to be unmasked. Um, the numbers are different for the preschoolers because they can't be vaccinated at this point. Um, I, but I do realize that they also have probably more risk, I mean, more, yeah, more risk, more, more harm done. Um, and I noted that although the CDC has changed their guidelines, they're still in the process of updating their pages for early childhood education. And I would like us to follow and see what their recommendations are. Um, it wasn't clear from the tiny bit that they wrote about updating whether it will be totally consistent with the elementary school or if there's gonna be some differences. And, and so I'm, I'd like us to follow that. And if they recommend that we can start having kids go unmasked that we do that even at the preschool level. So thank you. Is there any other member? Uh, Ms. Sexton. Thank you. Um, I agree with um, Mr. Hainer and Dr. Allison Ampi in terms of supporting you in this recommendation. I think that you've shared a lot of clear data about why you're making this decision. I think you've been incredibly thoughtful about it. The, the added piece about you know staff and teachers talking to students, um, I think that's a layer that not every district is considering when they're making this kind of decision. And so I, I really appreciate the way that you and your team have taken um, not only the health and safety, but the, the, the emotional piece of, of this change. This is a huge change. People have been masking in schools for a year and a half. Um, and, and so it's, you've thought a lot about what that's going to look like and feel like for, for students. Um, my one question for you is what is lunch going to look like in the sense that there are going to be students and families who are going to continue to choose to mask and at lunch, they're not going to have that choice. They're going to need to unmask also. And so I'm just wondering if the protocols at lunch are going to continue with the distancing. I know the ventilation um, has always been there, but um, just thinking about that for families who are who are concerned and whose students will continue to mask um, by choice. So right now our protocols have dropped some of the cohorting um, work that we had done during the school year where students, we had some pretty strict seating charts so that we could do contact tracing. But since we dropped the contact tracing requirements earlier this year, uh, we don't necessarily need to keep to as strict of seating charts. And so students are not necessarily sitting next to all the same people that they sit next to during the regular day, but the lunch sizes, the size of the number of students in, in any given cafeteria haven't changed. And so lunch will look largely the same as it does right now and as it has for the last month and a half. Um, we're not going to be you know, having fewer lunches so there are more students in the cafeteria, certainly. We're gonna continue to keep the windows open, the air purifiers on. But as I noted, if we start to notice anything, if we start to have any concerns, we could return to potting. Um, we could return in, in a particular classroom or say, you know, sit with your table mates when you go to lunch today without even needing to necessarily redo strict seating charts um, so that we can mitigate any spread that we think might be happening. And we're also looking forward to some warmer weather. And I think one thing that will be a holdover from the pandemic is that the kids enjoy eating outside when they have the opportunity to do so. And so as we look forward to spring, we'll also look forward to doing some more eating outside again, regardless of what our protocols are. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Hainer. Mr. Slickman, did you have your hand up? Yes, I did. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question really comes in terms of transportation, uh, which I, I'm really interested in making sure that we're consistent and that whatever we're asking to be done makes some logical sense. Now, at this point, uh, MBTA and all other transit is required to mask on on buses so there is a consistency 
um, as students would be getting on our bus versus the 77 or any other transit instrument. I would, if the federal and state uh, mask requirement for transportation is lifted, I would urge the superintendent to think about that as a trigger to remove masking uh, on the buses. Uh, other than that, I'm, I'm really impressed by the hard work that's gone into this and the thoughtful outcomes that we have. Um, I, I think I feel very comfortable with this proposal going forward. I think it is time to remove the mask mandate. I think we should start acting a little more like Japan. It, when people feel the need to mask, they mask, um, either because they're anxious about catching something or because they feel like they're coming down with something and would like to protect others. Uh, I think that's where we're going as a society. I think that we will come out of this pandemic a better society uh, and a more considerate one as a result of this. And I think that this is a tremendous opportunity to educate our children uh, in terms of their own personal health, safety and respect for others. So uh, I fully support the superintendent's proposal and I look forward to its implementation on Monday. Thank you. Ms. Morgan, did you have your hand up? Yes. I just need some clarification about what's going to happen. I understand the proposal for the preschool sort of moving forward, but I'm not clear on how that gets changed to a mask optional um, and how quickly that can be done. Um, I hope that it can be done quickly. So I, I just, I don't, I don't want to have to come back here and have anything hold that up. So I guess I just need more explanation on what that looks like. Yes, my what that, I mean, we're kind of like, I mean, we're sort of writing this as we go, right? So what does that look like to you, I guess, Dr. Holman? So I anticipate that we will receive a number of exemptions um, from families who are looking for their child to be able to come to Monotomy without a mask. And I anticipate we will be granting those exemptions. And so that's going to give us an opportunity to see how it goes with students who would really instructionally benefit. And we have a number of them at Monotomy who would instructionally benefit from um, not having a mask on, us being able to see their faces, um, teachers being able to make the decision about when to pull their masks down, especially like when they're teaching phonics um, or if a student's receiving speech uh, instruction or in similar situations like that, or even when we're working with a student who's having an emotional challenge, it sometimes helps to be able to see their full faces. We're going to assess this all throughout this month. If we're in a position where this feels really successful, we're going to consult with the Board of Health. Uh, we're going to talk to um, Joyce um, Schlinger at Monotomy, see how things are going. We're going to keep an eye on case rates at Monotomy and do so in an environment that we feel will be slightly more protected because staff are wearing their masks more consistently and um, then in our maybe in our other settings and more students are coming to school with their masks on. And we're also going to watch what happens in our other schools and how this goes in our other schools where we do have vaccinated students. And if we feel like we're in a place uh, when we hit April where we can make masks optional for all of our monotomy students, then I'd like the ability to make that decision. Um, and if we're not and we feel like we need another month to keep an eye on things and see how things go, and then we would like to be able to do that as well. Does that answer your question, Ms. Morgan? Yeah, it does. And I mean, I suppose if if this committee felt like it was not on board with waiting another month, then we will have, you know, we'll have another meeting and could certainly, um, I mean, we're sort of, so me personally, what I said two weeks ago, I still believe, I don't think this is a political decision. I don't think it's something that we need to vote on. Um, and I think that it's something that I was very comfortable giving you the authority to determine operationally. Obviously the Board of Health said that, you know, whenever it was like Thursday, a couple, you know, two weeks ago, actually, right? They lifted their mask mandate. We could have done it on Monday. I was very comfortable with the operational recommendation to wait out this week, I think was very sensible. And I think, um, you know, uh, meant that there was, you know, more trust from the community. So 
super support that. I think where it's tricky for me is that we're now going to vote on this. So it makes me feel like, like I, I get confused about the preschool because of that, because we're sort of setting precedent here, right? Because we're, we're coming here and voting on it. So I guess we, you know, we, we can see how things go. We meet again in two weeks. Um, and if it, you know, if it feels like we need to talk about it, then I presume you'll be able to give us an update about this at that time that that would happen anyway. Um, so I just wanted to understand because we're sort of, um, you know, bifurcating preschool a little bit here, right? How, how, how we see that that's going to work. And if other people feel differently, obviously that's fine too. So, okay, thank you. Mr. Thielman. Yeah, I was just going to move adoption of the superintendent's proposal. Well, I, before you do this, yeah. Be, before you do that, I, I want to give Mr. Carden a chance if he wants to talk. If he doesn't, I'll, I'll come back to you. Mr. Carden. Sure. Um, uh, my, my question actually is not on this particular motion, but uh, community ed. I uh, wasn't aware of that policy. That's not directly in the presentation or in our remit. But uh, I do wonder if we're going to reconsider that, given that it's kind of an outlier at this point. Mm -hmm. So um, one, if you recall, the policy that we have around vaccinations that for particularly our extracurricular activities was that if it was a rostered extracurricular activity and one that was not part of our regular educational programming, one that we deemed a rostered extracurricular activity, that we could implement a requirement for vaccination. Notably and very importantly, that uh, requirement that they put out also has the ability to request a religious or um, medical exemption to it, just like any of our other requirements would. When I was asked by Ms. Rothenberg uh, whether or not they could implement a vaccine requirement um, and whether they could be considered a rost uh, rostered extracurricular activity, I had a conversation with her about that and said that I thought that that was possible. Um, and I suppose she's moved forward with that. And so if that's something that we need to have more conversation about, whether or not that constitutes a rostered extracurricular activity, I think it makes sense for it too. Um, however, uh, if that's not in the spirit of the policy from the school committee, I would welcome that feedback. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't discussed, so I deferred to the policy subcommittee as to whether um, uh, that's something we want to discuss or um, uh, just let, let continue for the rest of the year and then readdress the policy for next year. But um, I think it only applies to the 21, 2021 school year, actually, 2022 school year. So, mm -hmm. um, all right, that's, that's it for me. Thanks. Mr. Thelman. I'm very supportive of this, and I was just going to make a motion to accept the superintendent's proposal. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any further discussion before we call the vote? Roll call vote. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Ms. Sexton. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Carden. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Dr. Rampey. Did you say me? Yes. Yes. And I vote yes, unanimous vote. Thank you, Dr. Holman. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is literacy report from Dr. McNeil. Thank you. So I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> so can everybody see my screen? Yes. Um, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to present tonight. Um, I wanted to present a literacy report, program report, and that's based upon the recent feedback we've received from the community and questions about our current uh, curriculum resources. I thought it was a good time to share the recent updates and future plans for, the, for our K-5 literacy program. As a result, my objective for giving the presentation is to review current updates to the K-5 literacy instruction. And these updates have taken place over the past year. Look at you know, our foundation for um, identifying the standards which influence the lessons and the activities that we uh, incorporate into our instruction. 
talk about what's new. Again, those things that we've incorporated over the past year and look at on the horizon, what are our next steps for addressing concerns about the units of study? And then I'll open it up for comments and questions. Before I dive into the content of the presentation, I just want to um, present this quote uh, from Dr. Goldie Muhammad, who is the author of, of Cultivating Genius. Um, literacy is not just about reading words on the page. It also carries some sort of action. In other words, reading and writing and transform are, are transform transformative acts that improve self and society. And it represents why teaching literacy is so important. So when students develop their ability to access different kinds of texts, they are exposed to a world in which they can learn more about who they are learn about other cultures and understand where they fit into the larger world. As a result, if we work to personalize their educational experiences, they will become more engaged and invested in their own learning and progress. And I also wanna point out this quote was inspired by a speech given by James Fortin to the American Moral Reform Society on August 17th, 1937. James Fortin was a wealthy African-American abolitionist who used his influence and resources to fight for the civil rights for African-Americans. He helped to fund the newspaper, The Liberator. His speech centered on the importance of becoming literate. During this time, black people had to form their own literary societies to teach each other how to read and write. They understood the power of becoming literate. They also utilized their literacy skills to advocate for their equal rights and the abolishment of slavery. So this is an example of us using multicultural education in order to connect to students and give them a reason for becoming literate. And so these examples can maybe help them to understand the power um, of literacy. So in the next, next slide, um, I want to point out the, the sources or the foundation that we utilize in order to select the standards. A lot of times I mentioned this during our meetings. Um, so, and, and the first two resources are available on our website and the, you know, the Massachusetts English Language Arts Literacy Framework um, is organized to include guiding principles, a definition for what students should be able to do when they, to become college and career ready and ready for civic participation and provide, and they also provide anchor standards and grade level specific standards. And we also have on our website, the curriculum family guides, which provide a summary of what students should be able to know and be able to do at the end of each grade for each content area. So those resources are available for families. And then lastly, you'll see there's a, if you click on that link, you'll see what our 2021, 2022 K through five ELA curriculum map and standards so these are the key understandings that, that we want students to, to know as they matriculate up to the next grade. The literacy coaches have reviewed the state standards, which are available in the first resource you see as the Massachusetts the framework, and have identified those essential standards that need to be taught for each grade based upon what was covered last year. So they've utilized also the uh, literacy assessments to also identify those standards. And um, so they completed this work during the summertime when they met with teacher teams in order to identify what those standards were for this year. So this is a timeline um, and this slide represents action steps that we took last year. I'm not gonna read each one of the, you know, um, the text below, but you can see that this, this work started Actually, it started two years ago. It's building off of work that we started for our uh, grades one and two. But I wanted to highlight these milestones that took place last year during the pandemic. And um, so they include PD, and it started off with PD from Dr. Melissa Orkin, where she met with K through two teachers to talk about the science of reading. And um, so it's based upon the research and the pandemic, we thought it would be prudent to expedite our plans to ensure that we shifted to a structural literacy program in grades K through three. So the work that we started in, in grades one and two, we had a plan for that, but then we expedited that plan based upon the circumstances of the pandemic 
and what we thought that students would need in order to recover from the you know, different formats of instruction that we had to implement last year. And I also wanna emphasize that we're still providing professional development to support the implementation of most of the recent resources we have purchased. And the last thing I wanted to emphasize is right here, winter 2022, a few weeks ago, elementary principals and literacy coaches received training on the Amplify platform, which houses our Dibbles data. And so we wanna also make sure that we're understanding how to not only administer those subtests that we added to our battery of literacy assessments, but we also wanna be able to interpret that data and be able to use it, use it along with other sources of data like student work and teacher observation in order to inform our instruction. And again, I'm gonna talk about when, that, when those conversations take place is during those ACE block meetings that we've integrated into the elementary schedule. So those ACE block meetings have proved to be invaluable for um, coaches to meet with uh, building administrators and classroom teachers in order to talk about instruction and to review data. Make sure that I've done that. So moving on to the next slide. So this slide is a graphic representation of the research that identifies the skills that students need to develop in order to become skilled and strategic readers. Our goal for instruction is to develop our students' language comprehension and word rec recognition skills so that they become, uh, again, skilled and strategic readers. The reading rope is a visual, visual representation that exhibits how the rope becomes more tightly intertwined as students master all of the skills. And I took this slide from an actual PD presentation that the literacy coaches put together for our kindergarten teachers when they were giving them um, an overview of what was new for this year. And there's a link that's embedded within the slide, which contains a short video that explains how the skills presented in the reading rope provide students with the ability to become strategic and develop the automaticity needed to comprehend text. As they become skillful readers, students can develop a criticality for interpreting text and this is important as we want students to go just beyond accepting everything that they read and develop a way to like, uh, you know, um, like I said, critically um, evaluate the information and be able to also question and challenge it as well. And so that, that is, this is a representation, a summary of the, the science of reading of the, um, different types of foundational skills that we want students to be able to um, develop. Now within our early literacy instruction. So this slide represents, you know, I talked about the different things that we did in the timeline, you know, the PD, the um, type of uh, resources that we purchased um, in, in order to target certain grade levels. So this is like the adjustments in action. And as you see at the top circle, you'll see that's the early literacy research. That's the science of reading, but provides a why, provides a foundation for why we made some of these changes in our approach to early literacy. And then as you move over to the, to the circle uh, to the right, you'll see the curriculum, which we've made sure that we're focusing on those foundational reading skills. We wanted to add shifts to our instruction so that we're explicitly instructing, uh, providing this instruction in kindergarten and third grade, like I said, the shifts for first and second grade were already in place. The shifts were made to focus on the foundational reading skills that students need to become skilled and strategic reader, reader, readers. And that, again, that research, a summary of that research was in the previous slide. And for our instructional practice, students are taught to utilize what they know about the relationship between letters and sounds to break apart words into smaller phonemes to decode unfamiliar words. And this is a shift from the three cueing system, which teaches students to use context and picture clues to decode to cold words. So as we look at our instructional practice, we also purchase the resources you see there in order to facilitate that instruction. And as you see next to it, like in found foundations, which is phonics instruction, we added that to our kindergarten and third grade instructional literacy blocks. And the geos are the decodable text. And it wasn't just geos, we, we purchased other um, decodable text 
as well. And that's in kindergarten through second grade. And the Hegarty are the phonemic awareness lessons uh, that we added to um, that resource we added to kindergarten through second grade um, literacy instruction. So again, there's ongoing professional development um, during our early release time and during our ACE blocks that we're providing to teachers so they can understand how to utilize these new resources. And then you look over there to the left-hand side, you see the circle for assessment. The Dibble subtests have been added to our formal battery of literacy assessments so that teachers can progress monitor how students are developing their foundational reading skills. The Dibbles are also used as a dyslexia screening tool to identify students who may, be, who may be struggling to develop those foundational reading skills. And we understand that from research that early detection and early intervention is a way to combat that, as well as making sure that we have a strong core literacy instruction that's uh, providing structured um, literacy program. And then on the horizon, this slide is talking about uh, is showing what we have planned is again, this is tentative. It may change as we, as we go along, but you'll see that we have various milestones listed here and their dates, proposed dates where we would like to complete those milestones. And this is again, looking at the core uh, literacy resource that we use for our literacy instruction for grades one through five. We're also gonna look at tools of the mind for our kindergarten uh, instruction. And I wanna talk about this for a second. Um, we have definitely understood that the research that's come out and about that has been very critical of the units of study and that research is around the way that the units of study address phonics and fluency, text complexity and language development, building knowledge and vocabulary and the way that it does not actually take in consideration our English learners and those students who may not, who need, who may need support with um, mastering those foundational reading skills. So some of the more specific around phonics and fluency is there wasn't enough, there's not enough guidance within the units of study for teachers in order to understand that enough time for practice for the phonics instruction and a phonemic awareness and that the units of study emphasize the three cueing system, which teaches students to use context and picture, picture clues to decode unfamiliar words instead of using the foundational reading strategies that we would like to make sure that are explicit in our literacy instruction. And there's insufficient direction uh, for teachers on how to use the assessment results to inform their instruction. And then for the text complexity and the language development, um, the philosophy behind independent reading does not challenge students to read more challenging texts. So that's, uh, and then, around building knowledge and vocabulary, it lacks guidance for teachers on how to use mentor text to build student vocabularies. And for our English learner supports, there's not a lot of research-based um, ELL supports that are present within the direction that's provided to teachers in the units of study. So those are some of the things, some of the overview of what that, what that research has shown for our units of study. So we wanna make sure that we address that as we look for um, a replacement um, reading program. So I just wanna just highlight uh, our K through five literacy team has done an amazing job with not only providing the PD, but bringing in, um, providing the PD, but all PD for our uh, K through two and K through, uh, K through three and a three through five uh, teachers, but they've also done a great job of identifying resources to support the instruction. And again, it's still ongoing. So they've done an amazing job and I just wanted to highlight them. As well as all of our teachers who have done an amazing job to accept this, like it hasn't been a sudden change, but it's been this implementation uh, around our early literacy instruction has been done in, in quite a short period of time. It usually takes longer for that. And uh, they did it, they started this during a pandemic. So we were dealing with that, but we were also trying to think of what we're gonna do in order to combat any type of impact that the pandemic has had on our literacy instruction. So I just wanted to highlight them. And these are some resources. Uh, again, Cultivating Genius is a, a book by Dr. Godi Muhammad, uh, Equity by Design, which is talks about the equity and, and, and associated with using UDL 
We have our mass literacy uh, link there that goes on it, guidance from the state on how to set up a, a structured learn literacy program, UDL guidelines, uh, progress reports, which we have updated this year to include um, some of the new standards. And then we have our 2021-2022 uh, literacy assessment calendar there that you can access. And then the units of study review, that's a report that I've really found to be very helpful to understand um, you know, the research behind some of the, and what I've shared with you was, was taken from that report about the critique of the units of study. So with that, uh, I will end and open it up for questions. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Uh, I just want to make a note to the public that all these references and the complete slide presentation are on Novus and they're available to the public if they want to uh, go into it. Uh, any members, uh, Dr. Holman. I just want to follow up on Dr. McNeil's presentation to say um, we uh, just to follow up on what he said about our literacy team that these changes and shifts that we've made to foundational literacy instruction in the last few years are very impressive to me. They've had a significant positive impact on third grade um, uh, achievement scores uh, in the most recent year. You can see the impact of the changes they've made through a pandemic on the achievement of our third graders just in this year's uh, performance compared to previous years. And this is also a team in the work that I've done with them so far that moves quickly. They're reflective, they're willing to think about the work that they've done and how to improve it. Um, and they're willing to make changes and adjustments and to think about how best to do that in a way that's inclusive and involves everybody um, who needs to be involved and who will be impacted by the change. So thank you, Dr. McNeil, for the comprehensive presentation. And I wanna echo his thank you to the literacy team and to all of our teachers who have done incredible work in this area over the past few years. Any members of the committee have any questions or comments that they'd like to? Uh, Ms. Exton. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. McNeil, for this presentation and the timeline. Um, this is something that I <laughs> am very immersed in myself uh, from on a day-to-day -day basis. So. Um, I'll apologize, Doctor, uh, to Mr. Hainer. If I get in the weeds, you can stop me. Um, <laughs> uh, so I I will echo what you both have already said about the adjustments that have been made in Arlington and really quickly. And um, it's it's challenging to make those those changes. And so I it's it's noticeable um, to me as a parent of a third grader and a kindergartner. Um, just what my now third grader did in kindergarten and what my now kindergartner is doing, I can see um, the changes that have already been been implemented. Um, so I have a I have a few questions. And as I said, Mr. Hainer, you can stop me. Um, my first the, my first question is um, so much of the conversation um, is about the science of reading, um, but I'm wondering where writing falls into into this process that you're you have started and are um, moving through. That's a very good question. I mean, this is something again. We have to do this, and as you know, as a teacher, we have to be very careful not to overwhelm teachers with like too many changes at one time. And I think it's very prudent for us to start where we felt like this is where we the, the most to prioritize how those shifts are going to take place. And so as we move forward, and again, that's part of like, as we move forward to like, look at other core literacy resources or reading program, we're definitely gonna take in consideration the writing piece of that. So we're gonna be, the, the literacy programs that we review, we're gonna look at the, how they assess, you know, again, their reading instruction and writing. So all that will be roped in as we move forward. And so hopefully we can find a comprehensive literacy reading and writing program that complement each other. That's one thing that we also liked about the units of study, the reading and the writing complemented each other. And so we will, as we move forward, we'll just take, take that in consideration, but we wanna be very careful about how we roll different programs out because at, like I said before, you know, teachers are still learning how to utilize the, the resources that we put in place this year and we don't want to overwhelm them. So we want to make sure that we're doing this in a very thoughtful manner and so that we can keep them and we don't get pushed back in there. It's like, hey, this is way too much. So we, again, 
we're going to move forward and as we move forward and as we review different literacy programs, writing will definitely be taken in consideration. Thank you. That's helpful. And, and that that's that's sort of a piece of it for me is um, learning so much new curriculum and implementing it all at the same time. And so while while I very much support the the process and the and the move to something different, I also am really, really cognizant of the work and the professional development that teachers have already experienced for many years um, with what's happening now and making incremental changes to, to support that. Um, so I appreciate that. My other question is about um, what, how you're thinking about the tier two instruction. So my understanding is right now, um, you use level literacy instruction, which is, has also been critiqued. Um, so I'm wondering if that's something you're also thinking about. Is that something that will be a part of the um, curriculums that you look at? I guess that's, maybe it's too soon. Again, stop me if I'm- No, no, that's a very good question. Yeah, the LLI kits, you know, again, that's the, you know, a part of what we're going to, as we look at the, you know, for me, our focus on tier one instruction. And so, as we, my assumption, as we provide this, the foundational reading skills and we have the structured learning, I mean, literacy program in place, I'm also going to look at how the programs that we review moving forward deal with intervention. And I think that that's gonna be something that, again, we're gonna to have to consider as we move forward. Again, we don't wanna make shifts too, too quickly we want to make sure that teachers are able to master and given time to really understand how to integrate it into their instruction and understand how to intervene at the tier one level. And that's where my focus is right now, because tier two and tier three, um, we've done that. We've done that in the past and we've focused on that intervention. We talked about reading specialists and, and how they you know take on students who may need tier two and tier three intervention. And I think we also have to look at how we're going to restructure our reading specialists and their caseloads and them dealing, having to also take into consideration the, you know, who they have to service. And so I think that's going to have to have that conversation. And Dr. Holman and I have already started to have those initial conversations about looking at restructuring that. Thank you. And my last question for now is, you know, this this is very much focused on K to three, and that's a lot of where um, the science of reading conversation has been focused. So um, my last question just is, how are you thinking about grades four and five? Um, so can you be a little bit more specific? Because like I said before, as we look at our core instructional resource, which are the units of study, which go from one through five, so again, we wanted to focus on the early literacy right off the bat because we thought that that was something that was a high priority, especially coming out of the pan pandemic. We want to take that perspective. But again, we're going to, as we think about the next resource that we provide, that we, as, that we purchase, it will definitely take in consideration grades through D5. And then again, like I said before, looking at phonics instruction, looking at word, you know, text complexity, looking at how students are acquiring language, their vocabulary, how they're developing those uh, vocabulary. I think that that's very important for grades three through five, that we have some type of spelling program, some type of, um, you know, vocabulary uh, program in place that looks at the morphology of words. And so I think that that's very important. That will be an important aspect as we review, um, you know, uh, programs to replace the units of study. Okay, yeah, that's no that that answered my question. I there were just some slides that were very focused on K to three, and so I just wanted to acknowledge that it was a K to five approach. So that's it. it Thank it, you it, very much. I right, it totally is. I just was emphasizing the work that we've done within the last nine months. I mean, actually, a year. This is now a year, and it really has focused on early literacy instruction. That was, that was our priority. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Mr. Schlickman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This, this has been an enlightening presentation, and I'm particularly interested in going back and looking at your reading rope, uh, 
because that's an interesting way to to spin it, so to speak. Uh, my question is, and I know we haven't been talking about writing, but I'm looking about the two structures under language comprehension that are dealing specifically with language structures and verbal reasoning. And my thinking is that as students master that, uh, they improve their writing skills and writing ability. So I'm wondering if you've noticed any substantive change or noticeable change in students' abilities to write as a result of this level of instruction? Uh, it's really too early to tell right now, to be honest with you. Um, you know, so the answer to your question is, I, I have not noticed, but, you know, again, we have just uh, completed our winter uh, literacy assessments, and um, that will be a, you know, we're still interpreting that data, and I can take a look at it. We can come back and talk about the data and what it's showing us since we've implemented the, you know, made this shift uh, with our early literacy instruction. So I'd be very happy to come back and talk about the data that we see and, and the impact that it has had on not only the, um, the reading, but also the writing. Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in that because that's really where the higher order thinking skills of all this uh, comes in. And if, if we're really successful with this model, which I think is, is a good one, um, you're, you're going to see noticeable benefits in the way students are able to process language, both in, as a reader and as a writer. Right. But that's also like, you know, just as an ancillary tip, that is something also that has been a critique of the units, the, the units of study for writing for the Lucy Calkins, that they don't spend a lot of time teaching the writing conventions like grammar and things of that nature. And so, again, looking at that balanced literacy approach, which is like, let's just immerse students in like, you know, text and hope that they are able to learn what we want them to learn. And that's why we wanna be very strategic. And that's something that we're gonna look in our next um, resource that we purchase is that there's explicit instruction about writing conventions and the use of language in writing. Excellent, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there any other members? Uh, Mr. Thielman. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. McNeil. It's a great presentation. I just had one question. The assessment tools that are the, the, the assessments that we're going to be using to evaluate this are going to be our own common assessments plus MCAS or what, what is what is our what are we going to be using? OK, so like to match to align with the foundational reading skills and explicit instruction around phonics and phonemic awareness, we've added the Dibble subtest. Okay. No Sybil Dibble subtest specifically um, assess those skills. So, you know, that, that's where the alignment comes in. We want to make sure that our, as we adjusted our literacy instruction, we also identified uh, assessments that would align with that and give us the information that we're looking for. So that's why we now have uh, put in place all the Dibble subtests right. for kindergarten through third grade. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Carden. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be the procedural guy and uh, point out our policy on adoption of curriculum. Um, and so one of the ways we do that is by getting reports like this from the administration and accepting the report. So I think this is all great work. I think I'm thrilled with the work we've been doing. So um, I move acceptance of this report. Thank you very much for that procedural. Uh, and I, I should I should go back to say like the recommendation to school committee will be made from the committee that we put together. So thank you for that. I will correct that. No, that that's great. No, my, my my other my other question was um, whether you were going to do that because there's there's always a fine line between instructional resources which we don't have jurisdiction over and curriculum which we do. Um, and units of study is sort of one of those things that obviously it's materials but it's also a curriculum. So. Um, so I, it's great to hear that you do plan to come back with us um, with, with more details at, at some point. I don't think we need to be a, a roadblock, um, but just as a, as a, a uh, as you share, as you develop more information and share it, that that's all that's, that we need to do. Thank you. Before I entertain the, the motion, I'm going to go to oh. Ms. Morgan and then Dr. Kiersey. Ms. Morgan. Thank you, Mr. Hainer. Um, 
Dr. McNeil, I think just my one piece of feedback, um, and this is just from my experience, that as you um, look at the writing piece, um, I hope that you'll engage not only obviously with our elementary teachers, but um, my experience has been in Arlington specifically that our ELA teachers in grades six, seven, and eight have been able to uh, put a very fine point on what their students are missing or what they feel that they need by the time they get into grades six, seven, and eight. Um, and they are uh, doing a fair amount of sort of uh you know they're they're filling in the gaps on their own with whatever limited time they can carve out and create through the magic of 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 the things that they do but my conversations with them have been um really illuminating for me and i have been incredibly impressed at how much they how well they are able to articulate what their students need to be able to do that they haven't been able to do over you know the last number of years that students have come through our middle grades so i hope that they are engaged with as part of this process obviously you know they're not necessarily going to be implementing but they are the recipients of whatever we end up coming up with and so i hope that their input is con is considered thank you well absolutely thank you for that suggestion we we definitely will make sure we put that in place. Dr. Ampey. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. McNeil, for this and for giving it to us ahead of time. Um, first, I second Len's motion, um, but let me ask my questions too. Um, first, for clarification, so when you say units of study, that's what we've called in the distant past Lucy Calkins, yes? That is correct. Okay. okay just making sure I've got, um, and I just want to point out that I remember when we adopted Lucy Calkins for writing that part of what was seen as the plus was it was to give, it was make kids less scared of writing, you know, it, it was to get them writing without worrying about conventions and stuff, just to get them actually communicating with writing. Um, and to me, that seems like a good thing. So I understand that you're looking for curriculum, you know, that has more explicit instruction in writing conventions. And I can see that those are important to learn and that they need to learn it. But I hope that somehow you know, we can also, I guess, we never really heard from the teachers whether the Lucy Calkins worked the way it was supposed to. But I, in other school districts, I had seen some stuff that suggested that it would. And I would hope that we don't lose that plus um, in getting stuff that is trying to be more explicit instruction wise. Um, then the other quick comments. One, I wonder if you might be able to write down in an email or something just some of the things that you mentioned about the rationale, you know, why, why you folks are looking for a new curriculum. Um, I heard them and I understood them, but I couldn't write down fast enough. So, uh, and then the final thing is just to note that the links in your re reference section aren't live, at least not in the copy that we have. So if maybe we could have a new copy sent out. Yeah, but, it's, probably, it's probably because the copy you have is a PDF. Okay. Um, I'm gonna imagine that. So I can, I can get with Liz Diggins and we mm -hmm. will make sure that you have the one where the links are live. And I, I do wanna address sure. that. So in the resources is the report that I've read that has a critique of Lucy Calkins, but I will summarize it and put those, um, you know, talking points that I, I added to the presentation today uh, in a summary and, and send that to you and to all the school committee members. So I will make sure that I do that, but I just wanted to also provide you a report. So if you, in case you had some free time in all of your yeah. lives, you could read it yourself, but um, yeah. I will definitely summarize it. Great, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And we and just I, need and I just I also want to I also want to emphasize I agree with you, and that's why I included that quote from Dr. Goldie Muhammad, 
because we have to understand the power of literacy and yeah. how it, it unlocks a whole world to our students. So we definitely want to make sure that we they understand that it's not just learning the skills that we want them yeah. to learn, but we want to learn want them to be able to say, this is what you can use it for. You can use it mm-hmm. to advocate. You can use it to explore something that you're passionate about. You can, you know, find out more about yourself. So I think that that's very important. So I definitely wholeheartedly agree with your comment. Okay, great. Thank you very much. A uh, bit of housekeeping first, uh, Ms. Diggins, uh, when you send that out to the committee, please make sure those links become live on Novus as well for the public. Second, just to be a little formal, uh, Mr. Cardin, would you make your motion again? Sure, I move acceptance of the report on the ELA curriculum. And Dr. Ampey? Second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Ampey? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. And I vote yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. McNeil and uh, please con- and Dr. Holman, please convey our appreciation to all the staff and everyone that's worked on this. Thank you very much. Uh, next item is superintendent's formative evaluation. I would like to thank the committee for getting uh, their bit of work done and getting them in on time. Uh, they're there. Uh, this is an opportunity for any member that wishes to make any uh, comment at this time on this. I will recognize you. If not, I will then Dr. Holman, do you have anything you'd like to say? Only thank you to the committee for your thorough and thoughtful um, reflections on the work that's happened thus far and for your feedback and things for me to continue thinking about and reflecting on. I like to model being a reflective practitioner. I really appreciate it when all of you um, provide your insights, your ideas, and ways that we can continue to improve as a school system and I can improve as a superintendent. Uh, it's been a wonderful first eight months, and I look forward to continuing to get your feedback in future evaluations, and that's all. Thank you very much. Uh, school calendar, Dr. Holman, second read. Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button. Um, We sent along, and I apologize for the tardiness of it, a final draft of the calendar. We had incorporated several of the comments that you had left us after our last meeting. Um, I won't go into depth on each one that we made, but we did adjust a few of the dates for some of the early releases based on feedback that we got from teachers. Um, Some of them had been right up against uh, vacation week, and so we tried to move early release dates for all teachers when we want to do some district professional development to the week before a school vacation week, so it wasn't falling in that week. Um, We adjusted a couple of the uh, conference dates based on um, conversations with our leaders And we also adjusted the key at the bottom and some of the times associated with the early releases. Um, And just uh, this this afternoon made sure that we made the adjustment so that the elementary early release is happening at one o'clock every day that there is an early release, whether it's an all or an elementary. Notably, the early release at the middle and high school level will be at 120 that allows for transportation. So some of the adjustments we made between the last draft and this draft was to make sure that our transportation department was going to be able to um, run with this adjusted schedule. We separated out some of the kindergarten and preschool notes as suggested by the committee to make sure that those are easy for families to follow. Um, And I believe that captures most of the adjustments that we made. So I'm happy to take any questions on this um, or for the school committee to consider this and vote it. And of course, if we have adjustments, we can bring them back to the committee, Um, but we don't anticipate any major ones between now and the start of the school year. Any members of the committee have any questions? Oh, I have one other thing to note. Um, I know there have been committees in the past that have looked at things like religious holidays in the school calendars that have, there's been lengthy conversation on this particular topic and that there was a committee that uh, Dr. Bodie worked with um, alongside a teacher. And I am looking to reconvene some of those conversations next year. Um, I did not this year, we just kind of had a lot going on. And so we've maintained a lot of the former practices, existing practices in the school calendar with the exception of moving the early release date. But I just wanted to signal for you all in the community that um, I realize those efforts have been undertaken. It is my intention to revisit them. And if you have any feedback for that, you're welcome to reach out for me, to me. I will entertain a motion to approve the, uh, the calendar this time. 
So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, and no further discussion as uh, I can see. Roll call vote, Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Uh, Ms. Sexton. Yes. Dr. Ampey. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. And I vote yes. Um, okay. Job description for approval, Dr. Holman. Yes, um, as you noted, and as I spoke about when we presented the budget to you a couple of weeks ago, we did include in the proposed budget an assistant superintendent for student services position. And tonight I'm bringing you a draft of that job description for your consideration for any feedback that you might have on that draft in anticipation of the ability to potentially post um, for this role or to have further discussions about the um, the role in future meetings and so i know that we'll be voting potentially on the budget at the next meeting and wanted to be ready um, with this job description approved for next steps in filling it and this role really is a restructuring of central office it's um a it gives us the ability to move some advise um, supervisory roles around and have some folks report to an assistant superintendent uh it's, it's it who currently report to the assistant superintendent and who are specifically there to provide um, additional services to students. It's also a slight restructuring of the special education department. We will have um, more full-time coordinators in roles next year to do some of the administrative work of the special education department. And we're adding team chairs in order to facilitate that so that we can have more coordinators working in a full-time capacity and more team chair support beneath those coordinators so that they can do that. And so that this individual can operate um, as uh, another deputy superintendent, which is common in districts that are this size and that have 6,000 or more students, um, as a partner to our assistant superintendent of curriculum and instruction, um, and can take some of the supervisory role, uh, particularly for the Department of Nursing, as well as for the Department of Social Emotional Learning and Counseling, and build some strategic uh, approaches to tiered intervention and to student service delivery in those departments um, sort of in tandem with one another and collaboratively with one another. And so we have the job description there. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about the roles and responsibilities of this particular position. Um, and if you want to vote to approve it tonight, that's fine. If you want us to come back with some revisions at the next meeting, we can certainly do that as well. Members of the committee, is there anyone that has any questions or comments on the Is the committee uh, ready to vote on for approval on this? I will, let, I will entertain a motion. Mr. Thielman made the motion. Is, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Oh, yes. excuse me. I'm sorry. Dr. Ampey. Sorry. I've been no. trying to think. Um, I'm just commenting to. Dr. Homans um, mentioned that this is a typical role. And I've been trying to remember what it was, but for something for school committee in the past few years, I had to call a bunch of different school districts. And I did note that almost all of them had an assistant superintendent for school ser student services um, and felt that it, it seemed to give a better organization to some of the um, things that school that school districts needed to do in terms of planning and, and structure. So I'm in support of this. Any other discussion? Mr. Schlickman. Can't hear you, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, thank you. I agree with Dr. Allison Ampey. I mean, one of the things is, is that our administration administrative structure was basically set up 30 years ago when we had 3,700 kids and we're now almost uh, certainly uh, almost double that. So uh, as the district has gotten more complex, our needs for leadership have become more complex and there's a reason why we need to do this. And I'm thankful for the superintendent for bringing this forward. Anyone else? Okay, roll call vote. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Uh, Ms. Exton. Yes. 
you did that, my whole screen just changed. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Dr. Rampey. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. And I vote yes. Thank you, Dr. Holman. Uh, the next item is interest of members uh, in holding office. Our policy BDA uh, requires, or it says any person that wishes to hold uh, an office, the chair, vice chair, uh, and secretary uh, is to notify the school committee secretary and the chair. I have had one notification at this date. It's supposed to be, uh, I'm supposed to make the statement one month prior to the organizational meeting. I am so doing. So if you have an interest to hold a position, uh, please notify me and Ms. Diggins. Thank you. And are there any questions on that? I hope there aren't any because I don't think I can answer them. Uh, interest of members, uh, excuse me, returning in person. I brought this forward that um, I think the, the we are in a position to for the school committee and the administration to go back into the school committee room. It is my recommendation to the body that we start on March 17th, our next meeting. We need to make a decision tonight if we're going to do this to give the opportunity. It will be in a hybrid for, form because the members should, uh, as long as majority, well, up until the current uh, dispensation on the open meeting law changes. Once that changes, a majority can meet. As long as four members meet in the room, the other three can be remote. So uh, if any questions, any comments, uh, discuss, I'm open for discussion. Mr. Cardin. Thanks. Uh, just a point of clarification. You had mentioned at one point that we would not allow the public into the meeting, but I'm not sure that's allowed. It, 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 well, I'm, I'm, I should not have used the word "not allow." The uh, it 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 would be very difficult for the public of any type to come in because they were going to have to come in on the base floor, uh, down in the back, and uh, if if we will have to make some accommodation for that, and and signs and things of that nature, Dr. Holman. I have spoken actually just today with Dr. Jenger about how we could arrange for access from the front of the building um, and how we could uh, make sure that that's staffed so that we could let people, members of the public in and make sure that we're maintaining a safe and secure building. So we do have some ideas. We do still need to have some further conversations about what the cost of that would be. Um, but we have spoken about it and the ability to allow staff to, or not staff, um, members of the public to join in person. I, I think that's important because when we, we were just about ready to do it when uh, we were forced out of the room, we need to have an idea of how to set this up because the members are gonna have to be looking at uh, a video screen unlike we did in the past for the, the, that part that is still remote. It will be a hybrid form no matter what. And thank you, Mr. Guyton for bringing that up. I misspoke in saying not allowed. That's, we don't have that authority, I agree. Anyone else? Can I assume that I have a consensus from the, uh, the committee that to go forward to this? Dr. Rampey. I'm just requesting that we're definitely going to have the hybrid form because um, some of it, it will enable me to better match my school committee duties and my parental duties. That Absolutely. And uh, Mr. Thielman, when he traveled, he won't have any excuse not to attend in the future. He'll have to be remote no matter where he is in the country. Mr. Cardin, you had your hand up. I don't travel that much anymore, bro. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was just going to say that, I mean, it's important to make this commitment, but if the administrative team and the tech team decides next week that it can't be done in time for the 17th, then let's wait till the 31st. I, I agree. I I needed us to say yes first, and then it goes off to Dr. Holman and the rest of them to work it out. So thank you, everybody. You want to vote, that. though? Is that what you're asking for? You want to, did we take a vote to not do it? No. no. So anyway, I was just I'm trying to, okay. so, so the 17th, we should plan on being in person, but it may change if Dr. Holman right. is still terminal. And I would ask you, do you all have that pass key? Okay, because it's easy to come in the back and like that. Oh, tell everybody the secret, Bill. They don't have right. the pass key. And, and by the way, the thing doesn't always work. Anyway. Uh, but if, yes. If, if 
we're having a public meeting, we can't require, I mean, people have to be able to get in too. It, it's, yes, that's it, what Dr. It, Dr. Holman is talking about them coming in through the front the way they, they did originally uh, and access the elevator on the third level. Okay, let's see. Um, monthly financial Mr. report. Hayner, just quickly, like, are, like we're going to be like super duper sure this is all because like I've been in meetings that have not been accessible and like they don't happen, right? Like we don't, it becomes like a big deal right at the last second. So I just like, we'll, we'll know like that, like we'll know before that day. I, I, I think it's fair to say that we'll know by a week from Friday. Dr. Holman? I think there are several things that we need to make sure we can figure out before the end of next week. And one is that we have the, the um, setup with ACMI um, Mr. Keene was talking about that as we came on, and I'm not quite clear on what he was telling us besides that there's not a connection established yet um, for the select board to be doing this. And so we want to make sure that we have that figured out if, in the event that's the case. Um, two, that we have our technical team um, on board and that Ms. Diggins knows how to run the hybrid meeting and that our technology in the school committee room is ready to go. And three, that we have the front door appropriately staffed to maintain the security of the building. We have somebody in the position enabled to staff that and that we've accounted for what it's going to cost to make sure that we can staff that um, so that we can unlock the doors and make sure that it's an easily accessible building and we're not scrambling at the last minute. So as long as those three conditions are met, um, we will be in a position to do this on the 17th. In the event that they're not met, we'd have to wait until the 31st. And we will notify everyone, the entire uh, committee prior to that. Yes. One, way, one way or the other, it's on or it's off. Dr. Ampey. Um, I just want to suggest that, assuming we're in person, if people are going to have to come in the front door, I think it'd be good to include that in, I mean, if the public has to come in the front door, it'd be good to include that in the agenda or, or something so that it's clear, because now we kind of have two doors, I mean, two, enter two entrances, if we're only using one of them, we need to make it very clear which one. I... I do a follow-up meeting. The chair does a follow-up meeting with Dr. Holman after every school committee meeting. This will be a discussion we will have setting how, how to communicate all of this and what needs to be done in priority. We all set? Thank you. Monthly financial report, Mr. Mason. Oh, That's Dr. Holman, sorry. Part of the adjustment we've made to the agenda is that uh, that is not on this week's agenda because it was on the last one. I apologize, thank you. Mr. Hayner puts his agenda together two days before and he doesn't check it at the last minute. These are things Ms. Exon is learning how to do better than Mr. Hayner. Superintendent's report, Dr. Holman. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, one of these graphs you already saw in my earlier report, but as I have been doing, um, these are the statistics with regards to COVID-19, both in Arlington Public Schools and in Arlington in all of Arlington, uh, we continue to see case rates decline in Arlington overall. And I do anticipate that we had a slight undercounting um, probably both the week before break and the week of break only because uh, the week before break, sometimes cases come through and we don't find out because it's the week of break by the time the family knows um, or cases don't come through the week of break because they're not absent from school. And so we're not necessarily following up on absences, but those are the case rates as they stand now, as I discussed in my earlier presentation, a few other minor updates. Um, of course, everyone knows the new uh, Arlington High School steam wing opened up for classes this week. Uh, Monday, we had a wonderful ceremony. We got to hear our chorus and orchestra students, as well as um, some of our jazz band students playing in the lobby, which has some really remarkably spectacular acoustics. Um, we, it is just absolutely gorgeous on the interior of the building and on the exterior if you're driving by on Mass Ave. Uh, it was really fun to watch the kids walk in the front doors on Monday and to see their eyes light up and to watch them uh, try to navigate to their first class. We did get to answer a lot of questions about how to get there. And um, we're just really 
pleased and excited that we get to enjoy this beautiful new first wing um, opening of Arlington High School on time and on schedule and really something worth celebrating. I did want to update the committee that we put out an RFP for strategic planning and we did not quite get the responses that we were hoping for. So we're going out for another round. We are going to be looking into seeing if we can obtain a facilitator without needing to do a full RFP. That's all about how much um, it costs. Obviously, if it reaches a certain level of cost, then we need to um, have an RFP associated with it. So uh, we're in the process of still trying to find a facilitator. We've been slightly delayed on some of this work, but our intention is still to have have at least a vision and mission, as well as some strategic priorities uh, that have been drafted by the end of this spring for a new district-wide strategic plan so that we can do the actual drafting next fall um, in preparation for some level of implementation in uh, January. That said, I will say that while we want to do some inclusive uh, strategic planning and make sure we're involving many members of the community. As you saw from Dr. McNeil's presentation tonight, we're moving forward on things that people have talked about um, with me and my entry plan and with us over the last several years. And it's not the lack of having this in place and being able to move forward on it as fast as we wanted to. We also got delayed by Omicron isn't stopping us from making sure that we're moving in the directions that we need to move and taking actions based on what we've learned um, over the last several years. I also wanted to share that we did uh, leadership instructional rounds in February and March. We just did the um, second set of that with our assistant principals and some of our administrators uh, yesterday. And we had a lot of fun focusing on the tasks that students are asked to do in their classrooms. We tried to get as granular as we could about what students are actually doing in class. What's the work that students are being asked to do? What's grinding their gears? What's making them think? What's making them curious? What's making them inquisitive? Um, and we do that through visiting multiple classrooms, coming back and having um, really structured conversations about what we see in classrooms and what we hope to see and offering feedback to the principals whose buildings we're visiting. I was really very pleased with the work that we did at Hardy just this week. Um, Principal Peretz was very reflective about the work that she wants to do at Hardy and things that she thinks about on a regular basis. And we ended up focusing a lot on rigor, um, sort of the complexity of the task we ask students to do. Uh, you have your enrollment reports. There is a new report included in the reports that you got this week. You have the typical one, which reflects 2021-22 um, enrollments, as well as a new report that shows the 378 kindergartners that we have um, enrollment uh, registrations from as of the 28th of February. I have, I am in the process of working through the first round of buffer zone assignments. I haven't completed them yet. My hope is to complete more of them um, by the end of this week and that we can message them out early next week to families who submitted their registrations within the window that was articulated in the K registration letter. So far, we have been able to grant um, all sibling requests. We did that first. And so we've gone through and made sure that all siblings in buffer zones um, or Students in buffer zones who have siblings who are currently at that school uh, are able to go to the same school as their sibling. And now we're gonna go through um, some of the other ones and take into account what our numbers are looking like and what our, um, what our assignments are looking like. What I will note is that in the spreadsheet that you have, it is inclusive of the selected buffer zone for the family. That doesn't mean it's the assigned buffer zone because like I just said, I haven't quite gone through and done all of the assignments of buffer zones, but I wanted to give you an idea of, you know, if we were to grant buffer zone requests as they came in and as people's first choices came in, this is what it would look like right now. And we are going to need to do some shuffling to make sure we maintain room in the sections that we have over the next couple of weeks. Um, but I wanted you to have an idea of where they fall as they've come in so far. And like um, I've put here, my goal is to have the first round of buffer zone assignments done tomorrow in order to message them out. Uh, we have given ourselves until the 15th as a drop dead deadline to make sure that we have everything out to families. Uh, we do anticipate we will be able to do that sooner than that, but that is a little bit dependent on how things, um, how things go tomorrow and over the weekend. So that's my uh, report and I will stop sharing and take any questions. Any questions, uh, Ms. Morgan? Um, so with the, uh, the buffer zones, they're so, they are so tricky. And it, once you go with that first, once you start doing it, you're committed, right? You got to kind of like, <laughs> you got to just push ahead to what your, your plan and your goal is. So I appreciate, um, just, you know, really looking at this super carefully. Um, and, uh, so I think the piece that I'm, trying to understand is, and again, I, is what commitments we made with respect 
to after school because when I when we did this a few years ago, there, I sat in a lot of meetings that are now have been like they've left my brain. But you know, we 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 created we sort of entered this sort of compact with our after school programs around like dates and and deadlines and and how are we and i know we missed them last year during covid we didn't get our buffer zones out in time like we didn't get them out before they needed to do what they needed to do and what what have we committed to and how are we doing on meeting those commitments. So these dates were set, the dates in our K registration letter were set in a meeting with all of the leaders of our after school programs in Arlington. We all got together, we figured out what our dates would be so that they would be able to do the planning that they needed to do and we would have the information out to families that they needed to have in order to sign up. Now it's my understanding though that um, some of the dates that families need to make some decisions by is the seventh. And so my goal is to get messaging out to families in buffer zones ahead of that date but with the understanding that our after school programs set these dates with us and have articulated that they'll be able to accommodate families who put in requests um, up until the date that we put in the k registration letter so we've coordinated on this is is most of what i'm saying and my goal is to make sure that we hit the dates that we've committed to um, in collaboration with our after school programs okay so we committed to some dates and then they put some earlier dates in um, I mean, I like I don't I, I guess I just don't like this has been such a like contentious thing for so long. And I mean, it just it feels like we all got to like <laughs> we got to all agree to the dates. Right. And then because like we can't agree to a date and then have even one program make a date that's before then, because then if you're in that buffer zone and you don't know. Like it's just, it's, it's frustrating. It's just frustrating because everybody's, it all has to kind of go together. And my understanding has been that generally the district has been meeting what we've said we're going to do. Ms. Exton. So I went to all of the, um, the websites for all of the in building schools and read their information and to the best of not my knowledge, they held to the March 7th, you need to apply by 6 p.m. on Monday, March 7th to be included in the lottery and everyone will be notified by March 14th. And that's what's publicly written on their websites. So if they are doing something different, they are not following what they have publicly posted. Well, I think what's challenging is that our letter said that we would notify families by March 15th and that's not March 7th. And so families are trying to decide where to put their um, applications in. Yeah. And so I, I, I want to go back and make sure that my office didn't mess something up in our interpretation of the conversations that we had with our after school folks. But regardless, we're going to send something out to the buffer zone families before March 7th, because that's the date that's there. And I'll follow up on any miscommunication of the poor overlap of dates there and apologize for any confusion it's caused families. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I, I think the trick is just if you don't get your buffer zone application, like if, if yeah, it yeah. people end up putting in for two different programs and then it takes them a long time to sort out who's actually showing up and stuff. So um, this is, yeah. Okay, great, thank you so much. Anyone else? Uh, Dr. Rampy. Thank you. Um, Dr. Holman, I appreciate the new enrollment chart. One thing I wonder is because it's not showing all of the students yet, because the kindergartners haven't all, I, I wonder if there could be larger print somewhere on it saying, you know, this is a, um, enrollment in progress or, or I'm just worried someone can look because I looked at it initially and thought oh my god we're having fewer students that many fewer students next year why <laughs> you know and and went down a whole thing and I just think it'd be good in large print somewhere so that people don't have to have the same problem that I did where I'm like and then I look at it. Oh, it says this and it says that. Oh, down here it says this. And, and I figured it out. But um, yeah, that's all. Thank you. 
good tip. I'll add that. All set. Thank you, Dr. Holman. Uh, consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 22183, $922,184.41. Regular school committee meeting minutes, February 10th, 2022. Sorry. I'll entertain a motion to approve. So move. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Roll call vote. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Rampey. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. And I vote yes. Uh, subcommittee and liaison reports. Budget committee, Dr. Ampey. Nothing to report. I think we'll be planning a meeting in the next two weeks. Thank you. Community relations, Ms. Axton. Thank you. Um, the, so uh, Dr. Allison Ampey and Mr. Schlickman hosted a chat on February 11th for with a community focus for LGBTQ plus families. Um, there were 14 participants. Um, and I'm highlighting this because um, I got some requests for information about it, which we don't typically do. So I just wanted to, to share. So um, heterogeneous classes at the high school were discussed by a number of participants. Um, tracking or the elimination of tracking in seventh grade math came up. Um, and then a number of people shared about L LGBTQ experiences. Um, there were members of the Rainbow Commission there. Other families were also present as allies. Um, some of the conversations were around bathrooms and changing rooms in the new high school um, being LGBTQ friendly. Um, questions about designated safe spaces, counselors or people in schools. Um, and then there were commendations for Dr. McNeil and his ro a role as the LGBTQ plus liaison. Um, and then the other one I'll highlight is the desire for more active programming to support parents and families in being allies. And then there were some conversations about masking and there were conversations about the challenges with availability of after school care. Um, our next chat is not until April, so I will mention that in more detail at our next meeting. And if uh, Dr. Allison Ampey or Mr. Schlickman want to add anything about their meeting. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Curriculum, uh, Dr. Ampey. We were very popular. <laughs> it was it was a busy meeting. We had to we could listen to people, but we couldn't talk a lot because there were so many people. We had to keep going, you know, okay, we've heard about this topic. Now we have to move on to this other topic. So we, we tried to listen as best we could, but it, it was a busy meeting. Thank you. Curriculum instruction, assessment, accountability, Mr. Cardin. Uh, yes, we have a meeting scheduled for March 29th at four o'clock um, to review as of now, tentative agenda items is to review a position description for director of wellness and to get an update on the HGI initiative as well. And um, there may be additional things added in the next few weeks. It's a while away. Thanks. Thank you. Facilities, Mr. Thielman. No report. I, uh, we talked, but I just, just to clarify, Mr. Mason and I talked the other day about a, a scheduling meeting talk to get an update on the playgrounds. So I'm going to work with Mr. Mason on the date. Policy and procedure, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we will be needing uh, a meeting in the near future uh, for several reasons. One is a couple of them are just pure housekeeping. Uh, we need to tweak policy BDA and BEDB, which are agenda driven uh, uh, policies, to include the cross reference to the land acknowledgement policy. Uh, policy BID uh, is school committee member compensation, and Mr. Um, Cardin brought this to my attention that uh, we need to make an adjustment 
in that policy before the stipends voted by town meeting take effect in July, as the current policy states that we uh, serve without compensation. Also, uh, you probably got in your email from MASC today uh, that MASC worked with the Attorney General Civil Rights D Division to uh, go over the policy AC non-discrimination policy, including harassment and retaliation. And uh, we need to go and make adjustments uh, to broaden discrimination to include harassment and retaliation. So that we're going to be looking at file AC, file AC-R, file ACAB, and uh, adding a file JICK pertaining to harassment of students. Also, we have the EBC supplemental, which we adopted at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we're really going to need to clear that policy so that we are back to a more normal operation for the 22-23 school year. So we've got a little bit of work to do, uh, and uh, we'll be looking to set up a date for the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. As Dr. Holman said, the building's open, and uh, many of you were there at the opening ceremony. It's very, very exciting. The kids, the kids and staff are thrilled. We, uh, the building committee, met the other night. There are kind of two two items for consideration by the school committee. Dr. Holman's going to forward to Mr. Schlickman and the policies and uh, procedures subcommittee a draft suggested policy that Dr. Holman and Dr. Janger worked on about a protocol for naming uh, inside the high school. So the school committee has exclusive jurisdiction uh, to uh, name any building, name any a piece of a property within the school district. There's a whole process we have to follow. We have to get the town memorials committee to, uh, we have to consult with them. Um, so Dr. Holman is gonna give this to, Dr. to Mr. Schlickman and the policies and procedures subcommittee is gonna talk about it at the same time. The building committee passed a motion asking the school committee uh, to consider naming, uh, uh, to placing a dedication plaque somewhere in the um, Performing Arts Wing in honor of Brian Reary, and to consider that request uh, simultaneously with Mr. Schlickman's committee uh, uh, discerning and thinking about the, um, the naming policy. Thank you. Are there any liaison reports at this time? Uh, any announcements? I'd like to announce that uh, the chair survived the polar dunk. Uh, the wind temperature was uh, 20 degrees. The water temperature was 42 degrees. Yes, I am crazy. Any future agenda items? Okay, it is my understanding that we will not be having an executive session, so I'll at this time entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Is there a second? A second by Mr. Thielman. Roll call vote. Ms. Dr. Rampey. Yes. Uh, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. And I vote yes. Everyone be safe. <laughs>